here, and I guess is the second or third thing to go. I forget. Oh, thank you. How's that better? better. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> Take it away. All right. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. And I, I personally apologize for not having a larger crowd. But that oh, is what it is. It's not a problem. Okay. I've you know, got four people with knowledge. That's right. Uh, I've been listening to everybody. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to do something that I've been trying out the last year because I do other programs for other groups. And. Um, what I'd like to do is, if you have a question or a comment, to bring it up. Uh, and I think that has helped a lot with my programs because people get it when we're talking about it. And most of the time when the talk is done, many people want to leave. <laughs> so, um, Or they forget what their question was. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So feel free to, you know, just raise your hand if you have a comment or a question, and uh, we'll do that. <clears throat> and I apologize for, <laughs> for giving the wrong talk, because um, I'm actually giving this talk, um, let's see, who am I giving it to? The Rotary Club for uh, Leesburg, Virginia, and it's, it's only a 25-minute talk that's all they want um but matthew says that i could come next year maybe in march or april and i can talk about what's in the name mm -hmm. um just to give you a preview when i was a kid i used to watch the flintstones <laughs> and what did they eat they went to the drive-in and got a bronto burger <clears throat> well later on um, I found out that a Patasaurus was a senior synonym for Brontosaurus. So Brontosaurus was out, a Patasaurus was in. And that just got changed. So Brontosaurus is in, and a Patasaurus is in. <clears throat> and um, the research that I'm doing now is on a family of microlepidoptera, and um, I won't get into the details like I would in the talk, but all I can say is, is that <clears throat> there are different ways that species get to move uh, that affects their name. And I know, you know, when it's something that you're madly in love with like birds or maybe butterflies and names get changed you know you don't know why <clears throat> and so uh, that talk will give you some insight into why names change and why species move uh, in the classification and we'll see some of that today i think so you're going to hear scales of life, <laughs> and I'm going to try these on. I'm getting used to them. So um, Linnaeus was the person who named the Lepidoptera, and all the orders uh, of insects that end in Optera come from Linnaeus. Uh, there's a few that belong to other people. And I'll talk about that a little bit. So Lepidoptera, scaled wing, and there are other insects that have scales. Uh, and uh, the closest relative to the Lepidoptera, the Canis flies or the um, Trichoptera, uh, some of them have scales, not like butterflies or moths, but uh, mostly sparse on the wing. <clears throat> so when you look at the butterfly with your eyes, you see color, a pattern. And when you look with the microscope, you'll see 
like the bottom left. You'll see scales that are like shingles on the house. They're overlapping and um, sometimes the distal part of the scale is jagged like you see here. <clears throat> when you use the electron microscope, uh, like in the images on the right, and that top one is artificially colorized. Uh, you can't get color from an electron microscope. So you'll notice that uh, the scales are in sockets. And uh, it's thought that scales are really modified CD because they have the sockets. Um, so when you pick up a butterfly and uh, a little boy or girl asks you, what's all that powder on your finger? Very <laughs> it's from ripping the scales off um, and detaching them from the sockets. Yeah. And so... Does that harm the butterfly? Huh? Is it, how harmful is that to the butterfly to have the scales removed? Well, I mean, if you got a monarch and you rub all the scales off, <clears throat> it, it might like make a, it... It would wind up looking like an isomide. Yeah. Right. Um, but in general, no. It, you know, it's, it's not like squeezing the thorax right, right. or something like that. <clears throat> um, the uh, middle slide on the right shows uh, as the one on the top that there's longitudinal ridges uh, that run from the base to the apex of the scale. And those are called scutes. And then in the lower right, you'll notice that there are little windows um, uh, and cross braces between the scutes. So it's also thought that uh, these windows are to lighten the load and the cross braces are to give strength to the scale. <clears throat> so Linnaeus described, so Diptera, he described uh, two wings. Coleoptera, sheath wing, uh, another one of his, uh, and so on. There are quite a few. Now, one of his students, Fabricius, um, he looked at the mouth parts of a lot of the insects. And he had a name for uh, Linnaeus's Lepidoptera, and it happened to be uh, Glossata. Uh, but, you know, I think most people liked Lepidoptera, and because there were other Optera names, um, uh, it was preserved. Um, however, uh, Fabricius did name uh, odonates based on the uh, structure of the uh, mandibles. So here you see the proboscis in uh, two butterflies and one in a moth. Uh, the moth Himaris. Uh, is hovering over the flower and feeding uh, while the butterflies tend to land and feed uh, that way while they're at rest. The, uh, the feeding tube itself is a modification of uh, the galea and I think that's where uh, glossata comes from, the glossa. Uh, which is part of the labium. And there are actually um, two half tubes that have little projections that fit together and it forms the tube. Sometimes when they are freshly emerged, you can actually see them doing that extending and you can see where they're divided yeah, right. they just yes. keep rolling them and rolling them until they get all yes, lines that's up that's correct off. yeah and then they roll it up under their face yeah and they can connect them mm -hmm. yeah so 
as you probably know, um, the butterflies belong to a group of insects called the holometabola or complete metamorphosis type of insect. And in these insects, you have an egg, a larva that grows from instar to instar, and a pupa, and then the adult. Four very different looking stages. If you take a egg of a grasshopper or one that just hatched, what you have is a miniature form of the grasshopper and then the wings develop a little later uh, as it goes. So that's called uh, incomplete metamorphosis. So four stages. Here's the egg. Uh, the one on the top left looks like a monarch egg and many of the, the butterfly eggs are upright. Uh, they're longer than they are wide. Whereas in the moths, all the others that you see, um, they tend to be flattened a little bit, like pumpkins. This is a good time to talk about pumpkins. Seasonally appropriate. <clears throat> now, in the lower right, you see a rosette, right? And all the lep eggs have that. And right in the middle, you see that dark area, there are openings to the egg that allows the sperm to go through. Is that before or after the eggs are deposited? Uh, excuse me? Do they deposit unfertilized eggs and then hope for the eggs to be fertilized? They're, they... they're fertilized at the point of at... being laid, Got usually. It. Okay. Well, it all depends uh, mm -hmm. how you talk about it, because the sperm has to find the uh, material that it unites with. So even though the sperm is in the egg, it hasn't, you know, conception hasn't occurred. So um, you can get technical about it or, you know, you can leave it as it is. <clears throat> and we have the larva. Uh, the larva basically is a, or has a head, three thoracic segments, and 10 abdominal segments. Um, in the lower right, um, you see a, a triangular, uh, we call it a sclerite or a plate. And right around that sclerite are um, two sclerites. Oh, where's my pointer? <laughs> So you see these sclerites here? Mm -hmm. They're like uh, an upside down V, and there's a triangle in the middle. Triangle is called the fronds. And these other sclerites are called adfrontal sclerites. Now, all the beetles have a head capsule. Um, there are many other insects that have a capsule, like sawflies, but none of them have those adfrontal sclerites. All they have is a line that separates the fronds from the rest of the head capsule. So that's one way you can tell if you have a lep or not. And the second way is at the bottom of the head capsule, you'll see a spinneret. And it's just not very long. Um, and many of them are, if you did cross sections, um, the cross section determines really what happens to the silk. So if you're a web maker, your silk comes out a little bit different than if you're making a cocoon. And then lastly, and probably the easiest way to tell if you have a lap is on those fleshy legs, there's usually eight and plus uh, two anal ones. So uh, four, 
5, 10. So you have 10 prolegs. And on each one, you have these uh, projections with a hook. We call them crochets. And they're the only order that has the crochets. Sawflies will have the prolegs uh, on every segment, uh, but no crochets. And they also don't have the spinneret nor these adfrontal sclerites. Any questions? So <clears throat> the next time you collect something, um, if you're not sure of what you collected order-wise, just look for the prolex and whether they have hooks or not. That that would be the easiest thing to look for. So who would have prolex without hooks, for example? Sawflies. Okay. Uh, I think you said that. Does they look very caterpillar-like? Yeah, the first in general. I had sawflies on our um, dog or something one year, and I was yeah. Like, and the other thing is, is you'll see prolex, those fleshy legs, on every usually every abdominal segment. That's another giveaway. Okay. Um, the other thing is, is when you upset these uh, critters when they're larvae, they will curl a little bit. Uh, so um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they do. And usually you find them in groups uh, mm -hmm. feeding on the edges of a leaf. Yep. Yeah, I found them. I was so disappointed. Huh? I found them. I was so disappointed. You fed them? <laughs> Why? Just, just a crazy She thought they were caterpillars. It's <laughs> not what I wanted. I wanted a butterfly or a moth. I did the same thing. Very well, I didn't feed them because they were already feeding themselves on the dogwood, but I thought it was going to be they were, something well, cool. I forgot what I mean. Some native bush I, I mm -hmm. bought and planted on purpose. I'm like, oh, wow, I got something. So, so I took them to some of the well, some of the sawflies are pretty interesting in their own right. Yeah, that's right. true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're all plant like feeders. Yeah, I was very bummed. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so then we have the pupa, and um, the pupae for Lepidoptera are termed uh, obtect, and that means that the wings and the legs are uh, very tight to the body. If you take a pupa of a beetle, for example, you'll notice that the legs are away from the body mm -hmm. uh, and the wings as well. And we call those mm -hmm. exorate pupae. So That's here funny. we have obtect. Um, there's a moth on the right, uh, a butterfly uh, in the middle, and another butterfly on the other end. And you notice that the butterfly in the middle is hanging downward and the ones or the one in the left um, is hanging upwards and it reminds me of the old time um, pole climbers for the electric company mm -hmm. you know where they have that strap that they bring up and so this has silk uh, that holds them while they just lay back now the good thing about or neat thing about the pupa is that all the organs of the caterpillar are histalized and that means that everything is uh, put together into like a batter you know and turns to uh, soup huh turns to soup yeah and <laughs> this soup by genetic control uh, will turn into the organs, the exoskeleton of the adult. It's really cool. A lot of books have been written about it. I don't know much about that, but um, it's, it's very interesting, just the same. And then we have fossils. Um, Here's a compression fossil. Uh, it's a moth, but I don't know which one it is. Um, there are many primitive forms uh, that are in fossils, particularly in amber. Uh, Dominican amber is about 30 million years. Uh, Burmese amber, um, usually about 50 or more. So, um, I've looked at uh, 
fossils in amber looking for uh, species in my group, uh, but I haven't found any yet. Uh, I, when I was in China, uh, I met a student that was working on primitive moths, and she had a, just a scad full of species. They were probably all undescribed uh, and all primitive type moths. Now, who's mm -hmm. going to ask were me these what? Fossils or were, this, were they, you know, recent? Well, 30 million years is... Uh, no, I mean, her, her collection, you're saying she had a lot of different kinds. Were, yeah. were they fossils? Yes. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah, neat. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's so, amazing just to find fossils. Yeah, and she had over 100, and we looked at just about every one. So, and, but uh, this, this isn't in amber, though, this one I'm looking at. It's really, it's really surprising it's, to me that the so something as soft as a moth body. This is a compression there. fossil. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, you know, you have strata in the sand uh, or in the rock, and you chip away, and luckily uh, so they found this. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if it gets caught in like a sort of a muddy pond or something and right. enough sediment falls on top of it yeah, and it gets it covered is. over that's what you wind up with pressed in an album over yeah. these yeah. years and this is why they're interested in mars because uh, if you've seen some of the pictures of the rocks they have the strata and at one time mars had water mm -hmm. and it had an atmosphere so there's a lot of um interest in Mars, thinking that there are or will be signs of life to be uh, discovered, or there might still be. Fossil organisms. Yes, yeah. yes. Wow. And what will they look like? <laughs> Hopefully not like alien. <laughs> now, the Lepidoptera uh, have about 126 families. Only six are um, butterflies, counting the skippers. Mm -hmm. So most of your lepidoptera are going to be moths. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, if you look at the uh, graph here, uh, the latest, uh, or I should say the earliest moth came about 300 million years ago. And that's a new discovery from Denmark. Uh, whereas the earliest LEP uh, was about 150 million years ago in the Cretaceous. So uh, generally, uh, when you find fossils, uh, you know, and you know, the whole organism is there. So, you know, when you find the fossil, you're underestimating really the age of the group that they represent. So butterflies probably are older than the fossils collected and same for the moths. Mm -hmm. So I asked the question about, well, why are moths more dominant than butterflies. There are about 160,000 named Lepidoptera. Only about 20 to 25,000 uh, belong to butterflies. And that includes the skippers. So why? Why so much of a disparity between groups? Based on what you've heard. Well, usually the first ones to claim an area are the ones that keep it. Mm -hmm. So if the moths were around so much more than the butterflies in terms of time, they had more chance to uh, occupy niches uh, than the butterflies. Now, the butterflies started to become uh, or started to radiate 
around the Cretaceous, the same time the seed plants started mm -hmm. to radiate. Mm -hmm. So there's a connection there. Any questions? Are, are butterflies just moths that fly in the daytime, basically? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I was going to ask thing. that question. Uh, let's go to this. So this is, and I'm sorry it's not clear, <clears throat> but this is a phylogeny based on molecular techniques done by Akito Karahara at uh, um, McGuire Center in Gainesville. So if you notice, and this is just the family tree, and you know what a family tree is. Well, this is a um, lots of a family tree. And you notice the butterflies are stuck right in the middle of the moths. So the question is, are moths not butterflies or are butterflies they flying moths? Well, according to this, Butterflies are day flying moths because they belong in the same family tree, or uh, we call it a phylogeny, as the moths. So they actually came from a moth like ancestor. In fact, one of the uh, closest relatives to the butterflies, they're called hedylids, and uh, I collected some in Peru. They fly just at dusk and only at that time. Mm -hmm. we, we would collect them at our sheet. How many of you know what sheet collecting is? Oh. We, we've have sponsored several moth nights. Okay. We well, that's how I collect. And I, uh, when I'm in a tropical place, um, I, I usually won't use a sheet. Uh, I'll use a trap. Uh, traps collect everything that goes into it. But when you think that the percentage of new things that will be looked at uh, will be high, uh, then it's it's worth it. Uh, like when I collected uh, using the trap, uh, I would sort the big stuff and field pin just stick a pin in it and put it in the box the small things like the ones i study i spread because they're lepidoptera you spread them you make them look good and everything else is field pinned the small stuff the dust <laughs> that's at the bottom of the trap i tap into a jar of alcohol and it contains flies, um, a lot of flies, some very small hymenoptera, wasp, and you'd be surprised how many new things have come about because of that type of collecting. I collected that kind of dust on the Seychelles, uh, Aldabra, and uh, I collected a Serrata pagona, a biting midge that was new to science, and it was named after me. <laughs> so sometimes you get something out of the dust. So the, the stuff's always been there, we just didn't notice it. What's that? So the, the stuff in the dust has always been around, we just didn't notice it. No. Well, just when small, I say dust, I'm species. just saying yeah. small okay. things that yeah. have accumulated in the trap, and they're all insects. And many are um, small flies, others are uh, tiny hymenoptera, wasp, that sort of thing. Just to clarify, when you say new species, I think you mean like newly found, and not like, but they that's were there correct. before we just hadn't That's found correct. Them. Is that what you're that's asking right. me? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, new to science. Right. And of course, it's not new to science until that dust is looked at by somebody. So yeah, it could be years before right. uh, it comes to be. And it was in, in the example that I gave to you. It was a long wait. <clears throat> so um, we're going to look at some of the butterflies, six of the families, 
and you have the pyarids on the upper left, and it includes the sulfur butterflies. And then um, on the upper right, the Hesperias, the skippers, and that's the silver spotted skipper, mm -hmm. uh, common around a lot here. Of those and below, uh, we have the Papillionidae, the uh, swallowtails. And I included these because um, a lot of people don't see them. And so on the lower uh, left, you have a specimen that is female on the left and male on the right. And that goes for the whole body. Uh, they can't really mate successfully, uh, but they have uh, the genitalia have uh, aspects of the male and the female. I, I, yeah, I have a genandromorph in my own yeah. collection. Bob Gardner has a monarch. And yes, he of does. what? <laughs> uh, Papilio troilus. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the uh, lower right, uh, you have Columbus. a female uh, tiger swallowtail, and then you have the dark form, also a female. So I thought it was pretty neat that to neat. Uh, include those. Those are once in a lifetime specimens. Well, um, <laughs> I had, uh, I coordinate activities for the young entomologists uh, were sponsored by the uh, Entomological Society of Washington. And one of our members, who was about 15 at the time, collected a polyphemus moth that mm -hmm. was a genandromorph. I've seen the specimen. <clears throat> you did? Yes, yes, I have. <laughs> okay. Was I there to show it? Uh, may have been. <laughs> okay. May have been. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, the males for Saturnias have these big plumose feather-like antennae. Mm -hmm. And the female also have feather-like antennae, but they're much, much smaller, reduced. narrower. Right. And this was definitely one of those. A little uh, difference in the <clears throat> wing shape, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the more you look, the more you'll find. So we have your state butterfly representing the nymphalidae. Uh, also, the uh, monarch butterfly uh, is now a nymphalid, used to be a denaid. Yeah, it used to be its own <clears throat> so, family. So there we go, you know, with moving species here and there. And it was all done by uh, molecular techniques. So it's not like something that you can explain to anybody, even a scientist, you know, uh, you can't really say, well, this is the difference, uh, except for the number of sequences in the DNA that differ from the other groups. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is arbitrary. You know, mm -hmm. you have to make a judgment as to which one? What, what we call an infallidae now <laughs> encompasses about, what, seven or eight former whole families of mm -hmm. butterflies. I mean, you have brazolids and uh, morpho <laughs> morphos. And yep. yep. I think even the heliconius are considered they are. nymphalids now. They are. Yeah. So, yeah, so those were all separate families. At one somebody time. likes nymphalidae. Yeah. <laughs> And then you have the hair streaks, the lysinids, and the uh, middle right, the male marks, the riodinids, um, in the lower left. And I thought I include the spotted Ooh, lantern okay. fly. It's an invasive uh, that came out of Philadelphia, uh -huh. and it's an invasive in my talk. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so. Now we're going to talk about moths, and the rest uh, of the program is about moths. And this is our only domesticated insect. This is uh, Bombex mori, the silkworm. And if you have any products made from natural silk, uh, this is how it's done. Uh, the larvae are grown on mulberry. Um, 
<clears throat> and then they're put into the center um, area, which includes uh, a round bunch of channels. And so the larvae uh, make their cocoons there. Uh, from there, uh, the pupae are boiled. Uh, and on the lower right, strands are collected and wound to make a, a larger strand and, and then woven um, into a, a product, like in the lower left. Does anybody know the history of this practice? And I guess I'm specifically wondering whether it's ever been tried with any other kinds of moths. Is there something specifically about the silkworm moth that allows us to harvest their... Well, I think the answer goes way back in China. Sure. I think that's where it started. Um, I believe the history of silk production is somewhere in the order of 5,000 years. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it, it goes back a long time. I'm just trying to imagine something back in the day experimenting with different <coughs> things. You could ever really find recover the, right the, the uh, uh, details about sure, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, who would think to do that? <laughs> right? Well, yeah. 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 How do you, who was the first person to figure this and out? My wife says, who, who thought about steaming crabs? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody did. I'm glad yeah. they did. <laughs> well, I think, you know, steaming crabs <laughs> is a lot more intuitive than the this. Yeah. 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 And we're going to talk about here's the uh, Bombex mori, a specimen on the upper left, and then what they look like uh, at the head. Now they have no moth parts, yes. and uh, there are several families that have no moth parts, mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> you know the adult has either a half a tank three quarters or a full tank of gas, depending upon how successful the larva was in mm -hmm. feeding. Mm -hmm. So you have a mating pair, and then you have some that are naturally occurring uh, in the lower right, males on the left, females on the right. And um, and those are naturally occurring in the wild, whereas Bombex mori, you can't find it in the wild anymore. It, only in the laboratory or where they grow them for sericulture, mm -hmm. for silk making. Um, <clears throat> and so that leads us to the next slide. When I was in uh, Thailand, they were trying to cross uh, Bombex mori with another silkworm. And the other silkworm had uh, a more range of hosts uh, than Bombex mori. And plus it made more silk. So they were trying to exploit the differences to get a hybrid. And to my knowledge, they, they haven't succeeded. <clears throat> a fella, uh, after uh, the Civil War, named Truvelo, a Frenchman, <clears throat> he had the same idea. So yeah. he brought a whole bunch of, uh, oh, I, I'm sorry, it's spongy moths now. Uh, the common name for gypsy moth was changed right. from that to spongy moths. So Is I'm going to... Any particular reason? Yeah, because... Of the because yeah, gypsy as a slur. They were ah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to call it Lymantria dispar. There, there's no, there's no problem with that. And so you have the caterpillar uh, at the top, and um, it looks like the male uh, down below on the left, and then the male and the female uh, on the lower right. Now, the thing about uh, the uh, female is uh, when they brought it over, oh, and I want to talk about that in a minute. Uh, when it was brought over, it doesn't fly in North America. It stays where it is, and the males fly to it, mm -hmm. mate, and she creates the egg mass where she is. Now, 
I talked to you about this guy, Truvalo. So he brought all these uh, Lymantria dispar over, and he lived in Medford, Massachusetts. And he had the same idea as these people in Thailand. Um, he was going to uh, try to cross it with another silk moth uh, that created more silk and had more of a range in plants. And what happened was, is that his caterpillars got out. And that's what's caused the radiation uh, in the Northeast and through here. And they think it'll reach Florida in several years. So it's still increasing in range. So he couldn't have just done this in France, huh? He had to do it up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know what was in his head and I don't know what species he was thinking about for crossing, uh, but uh, he, he really, a bad one. he really screwed up, yeah. didn't he? Yeah. That's true. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, they're not even closely related. No, yeah. no. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, lime man triads throughout the world. I don't know the number, uh, but. Uh, we have uh, a number of native species here. Yes. Not that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, normally when they're at rest, uh, they have the legs, the front legs straight out. And the antennae are a dead giveaway because uh, you see a plume and then they're curved in like a V. And um, most moths aren't like that. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to talk about the Saturnias, the silk moths. And that's me uh, holding Atticus Atlas in uh, Thailand. Came to our sheet, just loping around the sheet mm -hmm. and then finally staying at rest. And so we'll talk about some of those. And what I've done is included the larva with the adult. So on the left, we have the Cecropia moth. Right. And on the right, uh, Anasota rubicunda, the rosy maple moth, yeah. with the larvae down below. Now, I have had some people ask me for Cecropia, do those projections on the body sting? And not on this species, but I will show you others that do. They don't sting per se. You rub against the uh, projections and they the, detach it and the, in your skin. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's your own fault because you touched it. Huh? It's your own fault because you touched it. That's right. You did well, that a lot of times you don't even lines, know you did it. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Yeah. That's great. Right. And I think the uh, chemicals now are classed as a venom. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll see some of the players for that. So now on the left you have uh, Telia polyphemus, the polyphemus moth, and the larva. Now the thing about the larva is, is that if it's got a green head and looks like that, it's the Luna. This one has a brown head, mm -hmm. so right away, uh, you know, it's a polyphemus. Plus polyphemus feeds only on oak. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas the Luna never feeds on all, feeds on other hosts. On the uh, the right, you have uh, Automeris io, the io moth. Female uh, is bigger than the male, and he's or she is brown, whereas the male is mostly yellow. And <clears throat> you notice the caterpillars; they have these branch kind of projections and when they feed they usually feed together so they create this big patch uh, on the plant or on the leaf and so if you brush up against it 
you start to feel the burn. And there are many automeris in the tropics that are three times the size of that. Uh, the female is probably two and a half inches there. The male, probably two. And uh, in the tropics, uh, wow, I've seen them in Costa Rica with wingspans of six or seven inches. So the larvae are big yeah. down there. And these are all tropical species of Saturnians. And you notice all those branches. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so if you brush you up against oh, it, okay. uh, you're going to have a bad. Yeah, I got it. Are they Korean. all automeris or there's others? No, there are others. Mm -hmm. um, the one on the lower left might that be an automeris. Like an automeris yeah. <laughs> yeah. But these others are other types of silk moths. Now, when I was in Peru uh, collecting, um, I had the uh, privilege of collecting with, uh, let's see, not Dr. Lamas, was it? No, uh, although uh, we did meet him in, in Lima. Um, who is it? He's a coleopterist, and he works on ground beetles that are arboreal. And he's the one that used to fog trees. And he, through his fogging, came up with a different and very large estimate for the total numbers of insects. And I think he reached somewhere around 30 million different species. Just extrapolating off of the results he got from Yes, that. yes. Yeah. And so, he was fogging to show us, and he has these funnels um, underneath the tree. They're probably about two and a half feet in diameter. Uh, Terry Irwin is his name. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He died maybe two years ago. Um, and so, anyway, this Saturnian fell down, and, you know, uh, it, it didn't make the funnel, but it did fall on the ground. And stupid me picked it up from underneath, and then I purposely rubbed it on my arm. And boy, did that burn. And found out later that there's a species in Brazil that had uh, been associated with killing people. It's one of the Hylensia? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but it's the type that has these uh, spines. That'd be great for a mystery story. That'd be great for a mystery story. The weapon was a caterpillar. Yeah. And then a pupa and flew away. Well, well do you know the movie where a pupa was involved? I don't remember. Where who? A pupa oh, was involved. Silence of the Lambs. Silence oh, of the yeah. Lambs. Do you know the species? Oh, yeah. Carantia sticks. Sticks, right. Yeah. And do you know where the name comes from? Sticks, the river to hell. There you go. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of meaning behind all this. Yeah. Cool. I was just thinking of Midsummer Murder because I just saw them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you have the tulip uh, poplar yeah. uh, uh, silkworm uh, on the left and the promethea on the right. And they feed on totally different hosts, uh, even though the larvae look very, very similar. Uh, so uh, they're both sexually dimorphic males look a lot different than the females and uh, promethea feeds on uh, i've only known it to feed on uh, black cherry and uh, sassafras. Sassafras. sassafras yeah feeds I, on sassafras I, i've never collected on sassafras that's a, a good one yeah um, Spice. The, uh, it, it will take tulip tree I, I used to work with Dr. Frank Hansen at UNBC years ago, and uh, he raised uh, Promethea on tulip tree. 
Are you sure it wasn't a tulip Positive. poplar sphinx? Tulip. No, no. It, we actually raised them from egg on them. He was working with um, uh, ascertaining their chemical sensibilities to yeah. various plants yeah. and what have you. And uh, one of the uh, selected hosts was, in fact, Tulip poplar. Oh, I did not know so, that. Uh, they, 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 they feed. You, you, you find them in the wild quite commonly on uh, sassafras and cherry, also spice bush. Spice bush. Mm -hmm. But they will feed on tulip tree, and of course, uh, angulifera. That's probably its sole host. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what to feed on anything else. Uh, when I go to Massachusetts for the holiday, that's where uh, I was a child and grew up. Um, I visit family for about three weeks and then come back mm -hmm. to D.C. Um, so I would use some of the time to collect cocoons. And when I first started going to Massachusetts for the holiday, which was a long time ago, uh, it used to be easy to find cocoons. I remember one tree um, right next to a telephone pole, not more than 15 feet high with over 70 uh, Promethea cocoons. Mm -hmm. uh, I can hardly find a tree with four or five on it. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they've really gone down in numbers. I used to collect Cecropias and used to find them all the time. Not a lot, but I would be successful getting some. And now uh, I see evidence of them with old cocoons, uh, but I don't see any uh, that are viable. You know, uh, they have viable pupae inside. <clears throat> now, uh, I got my master's at UMass, and one of the professors was looking at a certain wasp, Spilocalpus, Spilo, I can't remember the name, but it's, uh, it attacks um, moth cocoons, and they started using spilocalcis uh, is the name. So they started to uh, uh, rear these and let them out. For and gypsy so, moth suppression? Well, they were hoping that, you know, uh, Lymantria dispar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, but I think that it got a hold of a lot of the silkworm, mm -hmm. silk yeah. moths. That, that's sort of a common assumption, I think, that has mm -hmm. been made because of yeah, gypsy moth suppression efforts. Not they're all not all chemical. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah. Uh, Ophian wasps are pretty common on uh, cocoon making saturnids too. Mm -hmm. They're uh, ichneumon. I did not know about the opium yeah. wasp. Mm -hmm. So we have the uh, uh, luna moth. Uh, mm -hmm. The one that comes out in the early summer uh, looks like the one in the top left. And the brood that comes out midsummer uh, is a lot more brilliantly colored. And of course, they overwinter as cocoons, um, uh, pupae in cocoons. And there's the larva. Uh, can't see the head very well, but uh, you can see it little, and that's green. <clears throat> And then you got the pine devil, Cithronia, on the left, with uh, uh, the hickory horn devil uh, on the right. The hickory horn devil has different forms uh, as larvae, so you can get them from green to uh, this kind of yellowish. Some are yellowish brown. And uh, I think I've only collected the pine devil twice, but I saw uh, some in the collection out there, and uh, 
I thought there was another place. Did you have one in your drawer? Yes. I thought so. Yeah, yeah. It, it, <laughs> we find it up in uh, the mountains of Western Maryland mm -hmm. from time to time. Yeah. Uh, I think it is also found on some of the shore counties as well. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, there's a lot of pine <laughs> yeah. area some of the shore counties. Mm -hmm. There we have the Imperial Moth. Oh, I mean like Dorchester, and okay. Somerset, and like. So the Imperial Moth, mm -hmm. uh, you see a big variation in the color pattern. Uh, mostly yellow in some specimens, mostly brown in others, and then a lot of in between. Uh, the larvae have different color forms, uh, from green to brown, to and yellow. in the middle. Yeah. And uh, I, I still can collect these. The Imperialis is still fairly common in this area, as is Polyphemus and Luna, but most of the other Saturnids are, seem to be much reduced mm -hmm. in their occurrence, uh, certainly locally. Well, I used to do a lot of sheet collecting, mm -hmm. and uh, the Saturnids that were most common on the sheet were the rosy maple oh, yeah, and yeah. the uh, imperialis. Um, never collected a cecropia, uh, never collected a uh, polyphemus, or I think once I collected the tulip poplar mm -hmm. So <clears throat> now we go to a, another family, the tent caterpillars, mm -hmm. or uh, Lacio campidi. The uh, the one on the left shows larvae in the tent and the adult. Uh, the larva has like a line that's found on the dorsum of the caterpillar, and the caterpillars feed um, outside the tent. Somebody starts and everybody follows that somebody and there's pheromone in the silk so they actually can um, reinforce following by uh, silk trail yes yeah. um, i know a fella that uh, he actually um, identified and quantified the pheromone and he used to give it to me on request and i used to make a a trail of a circle and they would just go in a circle like a little choo-choo train oh, cool. and then i would add another one and another <laughs> and uh so i had a little train going <laughs> <laughs> now on the right we have the forest tent caterpillar do you have it here? Yeah, it, it, it occurs in Maryland. Yeah. Well, uh, they don't make tents. They make a mat on the trunk of a tree, yeah. and they'll gather together and, and stay on that until it's time to feed. And again, somebody, you know, is the leader, and everybody follows. And the moths are very similar, uh, and they come out nearly the same time and so uh, the one on the right the lower right looks a little bit like the one on the left uh, the one uh, that's in the lower right on the left uh, i can identify all the time as um, the forest tent caterpillar and, and the caterpillar has either like keyholes on the back or little footprints or moccasin prints. Uh, they're very easy to identify. And then the other family, uh, the uh, hummingbird moths, uh, sphinx moths, uh, there are several names. Uh, and the family name, scientific family name, is Sphingidae. And in the upper left, you have a day flyer. A lot of people 
misidentify these moths as hummingbirds. Mm -hmm. uh, there's only one genus, as far as I know, of hummingbird moths. It's Hamaris. In this country. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There are several species, and um, they all come out at about the same time. Uh, at the top right, we have the Catalpa Sphinx and its larva. The larva actually looks a lot more handsome than the adult. And then uh, in the lower part of this slide, we have uh, uh, the, the Poplar Sphinx. Let's see if I remember its name. Bacchus Sphinx Modesta. Modesta, right, yeah. And then the eyed sphinx. Um, Excatatus. Do you know the species name? Uh -huh. Oh, Paeonius excatatus. Excellent. I'm glad you're here tonight. <laughs> and no, then I'm just we have off. <laughs> uh, two Manduca species. They're very closely related. They both feed on uh, solanaceous plants, and they will cross over for plants and. On the left, they have uh, Manduca sexta. Uh, and you notice on the larva, <clears throat> the diagonal white lines uh, mm -hmm. on the side. Um, and it has six spots of yellow on the abdomen from large gradually going down to small. Uh, on the left side, you have uh, Manduca quinquimaculata. Uh, the tomato hornworm, and it's got those diagonal lines, but it's connected by another diagonal line mm -hmm. and forms like a crescent. Mm -hmm. And uh, the spots uh, on the abdomen count to five. And they will cross over. You'll see tomato hornworms feeding on tobacco. And they also feed on nightshade. <laughs> now, what am I looking at there? What am I showing? Parasitic wasp eggs. Hmm? Parasitic wasp uh, you know, eggs. One, one very, very To be dead caterpillar. caterpillar. Yeah. What yeah. are the white things? They're uh, parasitic wasps. They're the pupae of yeah, the parasitic the wasps. Agenda, right? Well, the cocoons. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. A lot of people think they're eggs. That's what I'm saying. Uh, but they're actually the cocoon. Um, and I'm sure uh, there was a movie uh, where the alien, I think <laughs> it was called, that it had to come from this. Yes. Uh, where. Uh, a wasp would land on the larva, uh, lay either one egg that multiplies or lay many eggs. Um, the larvae hatch from the eggs, feed on the inner parts of the larva, and then they eat through the exoskeleton of the larva, form cocoons. The larva will die and that will be it. On some lips, um, the wasp will attack the uh, um, the larva and sometimes the pupa. Uh, so in the end, you never get an adult, uh, but there is some variation in um, the stage of the host. Now, on the left, you have the saddleback caterpillar. The common name uh, is the slug caterpillar. And this is another one that will hurt you. <laughs> they feed gregariously like uh, io moths. And uh, there's a little guy down below uh, that uh, won't hurt you. You can handle it. Uh, the one on the lower left. Now, on the right, you have two species, one in the middle, one on the right, uh, of the flannel moth family. 
of the megalopigidae. They're most common in the tropics. And there's the puss caterpillar down below. And that one will hurt you. Now, I'm going to talk uh, about several families that have hearing. Why would bad? I gave it away. <laughs> oh, you gave it away. <laughs> so, uh, obviously, they have these hearing organs so that they can hear bats um, and then try to avoid them. Now, the normal way to avoid the bats uh, when they get close are to just drop down. But there are some variations with that. So on the left, you have those elongate, this is an abdomen that's been taken off. And so the anterior part of the abdomen and the ventral part um, is what you see. And you see those bean-shaped things at the top? Well, those are the tympanal membranes. Okay, and where you see the uh, image in the lower right, the arrow is pointing to a tympanal uh, opening. You don't see the membrane like you do with these others. And so this is, with a combination of other characters, very important for identifying families. If you're not very good at it, you know, some people know just from the way it looks. Um, but this is a sure way to do it. A lot of people make a mistake of um, misidentifying what's called micronoctuity um, because they don't look for the tympanal organs. Uh, but more of that later. So I gave it away. <laughs> now, let me tell you about, well, I'll, I'll wait. So here we have the inchworms or geometrids. Um, many of the prolegs are gone on the abdomen, except the one on abdominal segment six and the one on abdominal segment 10. Normally, you get them on three through six and 10. But for these loopers, and there are some loopers in other families that will be missing uh, some of the anterior prolegs, or they'll be reduced so that the only way they can move is to loop. So <clears throat> uh, geometrids uh, have the tympanal organ on the ventral part of the abdomen on the anterior part. And also, in combination with that, the Hostellum or the feeding tube is uh, naked, no scales on it. And, that, and once you see those, you know for sure you have a geometry. A lot of people would know these just by looking at them. Um, so when you see most of them at rest, the wings are to the side. There are ex exceptions. Um, and even in other families. Uh, I'll show you some more. So this is one subfamily of geometrids, the geometrini. And uh, they're all green in some way. Uh, the one at the top right uh, is one that you'll see brown forms of. And you'll see specimens that are green and brown. And why would that be? Camouflage and different Yeah, it's a, just a variation in their camouflage, I guess. Yeah, but why? Why would it be important to do that? Well, if they uh, have several broods <coughs> over the course of the year as they approach fall and some of the leaves are starting to turn, it might be a way that they can continue to hide. I haven't thought of that. What else? Drier conditions, huh? Drier conditions, more brown vegetation. Yeah, well, um, if you have different images out there, and they're going to be in a certain ratio, mm -hmm. 
but like a search image for a, a bird or something like yeah, that. Yeah, uh, a bird okay. could be very good at picking up green moths, but not very good at getting the brown ones, right. or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And I'll uh, show you an example of uh, Bistone vitularia, the salt and pepper moth, uh, where the variation comes from man and not from uh, genetics. So the geometrine. There it is, Bistone vitularia on the upper left. Now you see a, a light form and a dark form. Well, there was a time uh, where in England, most of them were light form. Mm -hmm. And then when the Industrial Revolution came, uh, you had trees becoming sooty. Right. And so all the light forms were being picked off by birds. Uh, but there was a small percentage of dark forms which was able to increase. And so you had just as many dark forms as the light forms you had previously. So here's an example of uh, what they would call selective predation. I think they also sense um, industrial melanism. Yes. The, the uh, factories have mostly been shutting down and they've taken steps to clean up the environment and there's less so it's the, the mm -hmm. lighter forms are coming back now. Yes. So we've seen it from both sides. Good, good. Yeah. Do you know when that happened? Or within the past like 50 years or so. Okay. Yeah, after the 70s when you started seeing um, factory emissions being uh, targeted <laughs> right. for mm -hmm. cleaner enforcement and the like, it, it, the uh, model form looks very much like lichens that would cover the, yes, right. the yes. tree trunks. Mm -hmm. and yeah. The lichens were dying off and leaving the moths that were colored that way pretty exposed. Mm -hmm. So they got cropped off right and left. Whereas the dark form, which it's like a, like you say, a very small percentage must be at the beginning. Of, yeah. Right. Yeah. Obsessive trait or possibly a recurring mutation. And uh, yeah, they became predominant when, uh, you know, but by the 1950s or 60s, <laughs> they, they were the predominant form at that point. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, the one on the lower right is actually a predatory inchworm. It's found in uh, Hawaii, mm -hmm. and if something lands close to it, it'll actually bend over and grab it. The front legs are a little longer than in most caterpillars, and they're used to grab on. And they is that feed. its main diet? Is like insects that it catches? Yeah, wow. cool. yeah, it doesn't feed on plants. Uh -huh. Totally uh, predatory. Nice. I don't know why I think that's People cool, don't think of Lepidoptera. No, exactly. Yeah. There's actually a small group of butterflies that do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the harvester. And its relatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I study uh, some moths that are predatory on scale insects mm -hmm. in uh, Thailand. And there are some in North America that also feed on scale, cochineal scale. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, let's go back. Oh, geometrics. We talked about the tympan mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. Okay. So now we're talking about snout moths where the labial palps um, stick out and it looks like Jimmy Durante, yeah. if, if you know him. Uh, and these moths, they have the tympanum on the other, uh, the underside of the abdomen toward the anterior, but the feeding tube is scaled. Uh, they also have a satiny look to them as well. Now the ones at the top, the three at the top, are in the genus Crambus. And when you walk through a grassy meadow, mm -hmm you'll see these moths flying away from you. Well, most of them are going to be Crambus. And if you follow one, uh, you'll notice that they'll look very similar uh, or look like um, 
a branchlet that's been broken. So they kind of blend in. <clears throat> now, uh, the ones on the lower part, the three going across, are aquatic as larvae. They actually have filamental gills uh, to help them acquire oxygen. And uh, the one on the, uh, the middle right, uh, let's see, I think it's Daphnia, and it feeds on melons. Uh, the one in the middle, uh, I don't think it's a pest, and it's called Desmia. And I see those at the light pretty often. And the one on the left is in a large genus called Pyrosta, and they feed mostly on meadow plants and not considered a pest. Some more of the snout moths. We have Cactoblastus on the upper left, the feeds on cactus. Mm -hmm. And the Mexicans are really uptight about this because they have more cacti species there than any other place in the world. And uh, cactoblastus is very common and becoming more common in the U.S., especially in the Southwest. So um, you'll hear more about it uh, as time goes on, probably in the newspaper. Uh, the top middle is the Indian meal moth, uh, a pest to stored products, as well as the one on the top right, and I don't know its name. Uh, Indian meal moth on the lower left, uh, also another stored product pest. Uh, the one in the middle, uh, Galeria, <clears throat> feeds on wax of honeybee nest actually called the wax moth. And then the one on the lower right uh, has tympani on the wings, uh, which is strange. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the white witch. And wingspan could get up to about 10 to 12 inches. So Atticus may not be the largest moth by wingspan. And I don't know if you're aware, but uh, years ago, not too long ago, the largest moth family, uh, Noctuidae, had about 36,000 species in it. And through molecular studies, um, the noctuity got split up. And so you have the Arebids, which is uh, there, remember, uh, Thysania, the white witch. Um, and there are a lot of others that I'll show you, but they're all Arebids. And one third of the noctuity went to the Arebidae. So I'll show you examples of the Erebids, and I'll show you one example of the Noctua. So here, the White Witch. And unfortunately, I can't give you characters for the Erebids or really for the Noctuids. Um, they all have tympanal organs on the metathorax underneath the hind wing. And they all have naked proboscis or hostellum feeding tube. Uh, but it was all done by molecular stuff. And, you know, you know what's your key going to look like, right? So here we have the woolly bears. Uh, <clears throat> the Isabella moth on the left with the banded woolly bear beneath. And a lot of people uh, believe that the more black that's on the ends, the harder the winter will be. Not so. 
I mean, you're looking at variation. Some of the uh, larvae will be all red. Uh, I've never seen any all black. And the one on the uh, right is the salt marsh caterpillar. Um, and it's, I don't think it's a pest. It's a pretty moth. The Isabella moth isn't a pest. Now, you can see the woolly bear parade in the fall, uh, like on a day like today or yeah. tomorrow, mm -hmm. if you're in an area that has a lot of farmland, and they'll be crossing the street. Yeah. Um, why they're going that way, I don't know. Probably the same reason the chicken did. Yeah. You know, uh, I never thought of that, but you might be right there. Now, uh, here's another. Um, in the fall, like now, um, you probably have seen it in September or before, <clears throat> you'd see these big webs on the tree. And it mostly is cosmetic, you know, they don't cause a lot of damage to the tree. Mm -hmm. Uh, even over uh, year after year of feeding. But these uh, moths, as larvae, feed within the tent. So they have to expand the tent uh, in order to, to feed on uh, new foliage. Remember the tent caterpillar, they feed outside of the tent. And when they're done feeding, they go inside. And uh, here it is. Now, someone might ask, well, do those hairs bother anybody? And I, it's not like picking up a saddleback or some of those Saturnias, um, or even, yeah, saddleback. Um, Although some people, uh, I've been told, uh, are allergic to the hairs, sure. mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not, and I'll handle these readily. And symptoms usually just itching. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So at the top, uh, on both sides, we have uh, Anasota. Uh, not Anasota. Apanthesis. Uh, yes, Apanthesis. And Virgo is on the right. And the thing about those moths in Apanthesis, and there are some other genera, they have different strategies uh, than just having tympanal organs. They do have tympanal organs, uh, but they have other strategies for trying to escape predation. And one is... <coughs> They can actually make a sound that jams bat calls. Now, on the thorax, there are some. Do you remember those clickers you used to buy? I don't think you can get them now, but uh, when I was a kid, you know, you could get them like, uh, I think, in Cracker Jacks boxes um, or the hardware store. And they had a some kind of a character painted on it and you pressed it and it clicked mm -hmm. right? um, they had one of these in the dirty dozen too where they <laughs> communicated with the clicker <clears throat> but anyway this abdomen um, can move itself so fast that it makes this clicking sound and actually jams the bat call. Um, but if that doesn't work, you know, and you have a pretty opportunistic predator um, and it grabs the moth, the moth will exude a chemical, bubbly chemical from the thorax that's not good tasting at all. And so, if none of those strategies work, the moth is toast. <laughs> but um, sometimes it does. So we have two epenthesis at the top, and we have a haploa species at the bottom. 
And that one I find mostly in the field. You won't find it in the forest unless it abuts a field. Now, you know this one? Don't, I don't remember the scientific name. But it's... Uh, hypoprepia. And these, as larvae, feed on lichens. Lichens, right. Yeah. And they're really pretty. The one the, the on crimson the, uh, lichen moth. I think some are them. large and like the one on the left. Uh, and reddish and just gorgeous. What's the caterpillar look like? Uh, like a woolly bear, uh -huh. you know, with hairs, uh -huh. but smaller. Uh -huh. Yeah. And now uh, we have some others. Uh, the two at the top are Zali. And my favorite moth is Zali Lunata, the one at the upper right. Why? I have no idea, but I like it. It's just a really well camouflaged critter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now, also, there are noctuids that are blood feeders. And not in this country, but in the southeastern Asia, uh, they'll feed around the eyes of uh, bovine critters and birds and others. And you'll see the hostellum, the feeding tube, turn red, you know, when they're successful. We have the underwings. I used to collect these, and how many know the term sugary? No? Mm -hmm. So I used to... I've done it a couple of times. Yeah. Well, I, I did it a lot. Uh, we had a nice tree line that uh, was next to a farm, and uh, the farmer let me use the trees. And so I would mix up a batch of stale beer and bananas, a little bit of sugar, and... Apples work, too. Ah, uh, yeah. never used apples. And then... Uh, uh, I would put in some spirits, and a lot of people swear on, you know, vodka or whiskey. It really cheap wine. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't wine. it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, but you would collect these underwings, and uh, they're very pretty. Uh, you know, I, I equate collecting underwings in Europe as uh, collecting tulips in Holland a long time ago. Uh, but we have different forms. The, the white ones you'll find on birches uh, or the lighter ones, the darker ones, obviously on darker barked trees. Uh, they're very pretty. Uh, some get to be about four inch wingspan. And um, and they're fairly common. Now we have a, a member of the Noctuidae. This is a Grotus. Uh, the one at the lower right is a cutworm. And so what it actually does is chop the plant, just like chopping wood, it chops into it and it falls over, cuts it in half. And when these uh, moths are at rest, they form the triangle like you see in the upper left. And I think one of the differences between the Erebids and the Noctuids is that the Erebids have more of these hairs, and the hairs are random in terms of their position. Now we have a few. I don't mean to interrupt, but I have to get going because I have, my husband's going to be calling me and he'll wonder where I am. We're almost done. Oh. One well, well, last slide. Oh, oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> Good. Nice try. You're the one with the cookies, right? No, no she's, 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 she's the one with the cookies. I thought you were That's why you didn't want to take the cookies. I thought you were going to take the cookies. So uh, I have just. Let her out. <laughs> I'm not going to let Mary Kay in. 
Yeah. Uh, Ursa, how many have heard the term microlepidoptera? Yep. All right. Well, uh, it's a misused term. Uh, a lot of micros are bigger than the macros. Uh, I've seen cossids uh, in collections in Africa that have a six to seven inch wingspan and a very girthy body. Uh, there are others. Hippialidae. Uh, so huh? hippialids, the ghost moths. Oh, yes, yes. Some of the Australian ones are like eight inches. Yes. Yep. Small uh, So these are, in general, pretty small. You have the clothes moth on the upper left. Uh, the adult isn't the one that makes the damage, it's the larva. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And they're negatively phototropic, meaning that uh, whether they're uh, adult or larvae, they will always go toward the dark area. On the upper uh, right, we have the Ilantis webworm. Mm -hmm. So if you know Ilantis and you see a web on it uh, in the fall, that's what it is. But sometimes you can find them in the summer as well. And we have in the middle and lower left the bagworm. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, the only thing I can say about it is uh, I collected some bagworms uh, when I was in Maryland, and then I brought them home to Massachusetts, and I infested a arborvitae of my mother's. And <laughs> she had bags all over the place. Uh, but the damage is mostly cosmetic. And then in the lower uh, right, we have the Tortricity. It's a large family. Uh, most of them are um, uh, twig borers. Uh, some are gall makers. Do you know what galls are? Yes. OK, so gall makers. Uh, twig borers, and um, how many know the Mexican jumping bean? No, well, yeah. Yeah. well that's a tortricity larva inside. Mm -hmm. And then on the middle right is a plume moth, or as one of my students called it, the tea moth. And the family name is Terraphoridae. And when you spread them, you notice these large dissected areas of the wing. Um, but those are about the smallest that I'll talk about. There are smaller moths, and the primitor, primitive moths that are small actually have mandibles in the adult stage. Um, they feed on pollen. Uh, the Micropterygidae is the family name. And hopefully we end this talk with a smile. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, um, the talk that was supposed to happen uh, is about my research and what it does to names. And it's not only my research, but other people's research that change names. And I, I gave you one example with the Brontosaurus and the Patasaurus. Uh, but in this case, uh, I'll be talking about different ways a name can change and move in the classification. Uh, and so Matthew and I will get together and uh, we'll talk about that. It's compared to this, uh, I think you're going to be bored, but if you bring cookies, <laughs> you know, we'll at least have something to do while I'm talking. The sugar high will keep me going. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you well, very much. thank you for coming. Any, uh, 